Welcome to lecture 4K. This is a tutorial on cache coherence protocols. We already learned about two broad category of cache coherence protocol. The first one is snoop based cache coherence. The second one is directory based cache coherence. So, in this tutorial, let us try to take some examples and try to understand for a series of instructions or request for various memory locations. What are the transitions that has been happening? What are the ways by which the states of the cache blocks are changing? Trying to understand the messy protocol in a bit more higher level. As usual, today also we will take up a problem, a numerical problem and try to work with that. So, here goes the first question. Consider a multi-processing system with two cores. For simplicity, I am taking only two cores A and B with their own private caches and a single shared main memory and then they are using a messy cache coherence protocol. There is four, five lines of code running in each of the two cores. So, this is a program which consists of five lines. Now, within this program LW indicates a load operation and SW indicates a store operation. So, loading and storing. RI and MJ indicate the register and memory operand respectively. So, if with respect to load, I am moving something from M1 to R1. And if it is a store, I am moving from R3 to M2, like conventional load and store architecture that we learned in the risk instruction pipeline. Assume that the addresses pointed by M1 and M2 map to different cache blocks. So, M1 and M2 are basically two cache blocks. Consider the following execution sequence. So, now what happens is when you look at the serialization, we know about the serialization of instruction. First sequential order A1, A1 means the first instruction of core A. A1, then A2, B1, B2, A3, B3, B4, A4, A5, B5. So, all these 5 instructions, they all will be run by processor A1s and then processor B1s. But if you observe from memory, the order in which a memory sees the operation is slightly different. So, the initial state of all cache blocks is invalid, fill up the messy protocol table entry. So, let us try to understand what this uh, particular problem is. We have been told that core A and core B are going to execute these 5 instructions in some sequence. That is a sequence that has been shown. So, for easiness, why I am using a red color for, for representation of core A and I am using blue color for representation of core B, all the instructions that are pertaining to core B. Now, what has been given is this is the sequence. First, uh, the instruction 1 will be executed by A and then instruction 2 would be executed by A that is called A1, A2. Then instructions 1 and 2 will be executed by B. Then A3 will run like that this is the sequence. So, if I order the sequence, this is the way in which we get. Wherever you see the red color, there are instructions executed by A and wherever you see blue color, these are all instructions executed by B. So, once you see like that and then we have to see there are M1 and M2 are my memory, whereas R1 is not a botheration as far as coherence is concerned. So, I am loading something from M1, loading something from N2, then the same M1 is being used by processor B. So, now in this case, processor A and processor B are trying to access a location called M1. Similarly, they are going to access. So, you can see that a blue M2 and a red M2. See, again there is a blue M2. So, like that, we have a series of operations done on various memory locations and then how the coherence is going to get impacted. Now, we know that this is working with messy coherence protocol. So, messy coherence protocol has two straight transition diagram. What you see on the first side is based on processor. So, from the processor whenever there is a request, be it is a read request, it can be read miss, read hits, then write hits and write misses what are the state transitions that is been going to happen and what are the transitions from the bus. So, that is what we are going to see. So, now we will take up a table where initially I am going to talk about. So, this is A, processor A and this is processor B. This is based upon messy coherence protocol. So, what are the states that I am going to maintain? So, M1 is a block or you are talking going to talk about M1 is a memory location and M1 and M2 belong to two different cache blocks. So, what is the state of M1 in A's cache? What is the state of M2 in A's cache? Similarly, M1 and M2 in B also. So, that is exactly what we are 
trying to see initially m1 in a and b m2 in a and b they are in invalid state now let us try to see i am going to talk about the very first instruction load word r1 m1 so load word r1 m1 means the value of m1 is been read i am going so this will generally incur the since it is invalid it is an i state and it's a read miss since it is a read miss what happens the state will go into an e state because it's a first time that i am going to perform a read so what do you see there you are seeing that upon a1 is over m1 in a will become to e state because that's a very first access and all other states are unaffected now if you look at the sequence this is over the second one is i am going to perform a read operation on m2 so m2 is now in the i state and it's a first access so that will also take me into the e state so at the end of a1 and a2 we can see that in b has not started any instruction so the status of m1 and m2 in b would be in invalid state whereas the status of m1 and m2 will be in a will be in exclusive state now here start the new challenge now b is going to perform a read on m1 now if you see m1 in b is already in an invalid state and it is going to perform a read on m1 so when it is going to perform a read on m1 m1 is already kept in exclusive state in in a so now b also is going to perform a read so now there will be both a and b are going to read m1 so now in this case we have to know that there is a transition that happens your initial state was that of an e and that e will be now slowly becoming kind of an s so this is what you see when you perform a memory read you are already in e upon memory read you are going to become to an s state so now both will be in s state this is what we are going to see you can see that this is s this is s so when you perform b1 both the copies of m1 in a as well as in b will go. so initially it was e there is an e to s transition and here there is an i to s transition so i to s transition is based upon the local request and e to s transition is based upon the bus read that you see so this is called the memory read request that you see by b it is put up in the bus the moment that i see that i know someone else wanted to read so then it is going to affect me it will move like this now what i am going to do is b2 again i am going to perform the same thing on m2 so the similar kind of event that occurred now for m1 will be happening so this will be moving into an s state and this will also moving to an s state so my at the end of b2 i am go, going to have all the four of one in the s state that is what you see at the end of b2 so we have completed a1 a2 b1 and b2 now we are going to a3 so what is a3 doing i am going to perform a write this is a first write operation storing content of r3 into m2 so if i wanted to perform an operation on m2 by a3 so this is the line that i am talking about it is an s state if i wanted to perform it has to become m so when i am moving into an m what is the transition that is going to happen someone else share that there is going to be a memory operation that is there it's an invalidation request that i get so how do you get an invalidation request i am already in the shared state and in the shared state i am getting a request so this is the request that i am already in the shared state and i am going to perform a write hit so when i am going to perform a write hit my state will move from s to m so that is what is going to happen but i put an invalidate message box in the bus so when someone else see an invalidate message box they are in the shared state whoever is in shared state they are going to perform it into i so the m2 in b will be converted to i that's what you see and then the m2 in a that will be converted to m so this is what you see that s to m transition and this is s to y transition this s to m transition is because of this operation and this s to y transition is because of the invalidation operation now let us go to b3 so what is b3 going to perform b3 is also going to perform a write so now if b3 is going to perform on a write 
it is a right miss when b3 checks it's already an invalidate so this invalidate has to go to modify so someone else keeping that will come to i so that is what is going to be the request so what is the transition that is going to have i am already encountering a miss and i wanted to perform a right operation so i move from i state to m state that is what you see here and at the time i am telling that right with an intention to modify so anybody who will see with a right to in intention to modify this is what they see so it move from m to i so with this my b3 is also over now i am going to b4 so b4 is i am going to perform a store operation to m1 so when i perform a store operation to m1 so this is the block that i am talking it is going to be elevated from s i am going to go to become to an m state so in an m1 in b that's what we are going to see next s will go to an m so when it goes to an m anybody who is in the shared state they will become an invalid state so this is what you get now s will become to m and here s is going to become i so what is this s to y transition this s to y transition is because of this and when i perform s to m an invalidate block is been given and uh, that is a transition that i get so b4 is also done now we are going for a4 a4 is going to perform an operation on m1 that's a store operation on m1 so store operation on m1 means i have to modify this to m i am going to perform a store so whoever is keeping they will become an invalid state that's what we have to exactly see so this i to m transition is because your a4 wanted to have a right so this is an i to m transition that you see because of that i put an r w i t m that will be there so anybody who is keeping in the m state they will get themselves invalidated so that is what is going to happen in a4 now also there is one more operation a5 but a5 is actually a read operation on m2 so if it is a read operation on m2 then from i it is moving into an s so once i move to an s then this will get downgraded to s so that's what you see here s and s that you see and then with that a5 is over and last operation is b5 b5 is a read operation on m2 so if b5 wanted to perform a read operation on n2 so this is the final state that you see m which was there and that is going to be retained so finally you see that a is going to read so the last operations are going to determine a wanted to perform a reading on m2 and b wanted to perform a reading on m2 so what we have seen in this question we have given a sequence of instructions and then we have given the states for m1 and m2 for each of the instruction when it's in executed based upon the state diagram we have seen what is the consequence now let us go into directory protocol a computer uses a directory based cache coherence protocol for a total address space of 32 gb and we are using cache blocks of 128 bytes the directory is equally distributed across randomly across 32 nodes in the system so each directory entry for a cache block has one bit for the processor and then one bit per processor and then one bit for representing exclusive so this is a case of p plus 1 bits for each cache block the total directory size in each of the 32 node so each of 32 node has 200 mb that's the size how many processors are there in the system a very good question so let us try to understand what are the key points it's a 32 gb memory 128 byte block size 32 nodes are there and 200 mb is the size per node so what is the total blocks that you are going to be associated with the directory number of blocks per node so we have total of 32 gb address space and then what is the total number of blocks out of this our block size is 128 byte so this 32 gb i divide with 128 bytes then i will get the total number of blocks but these blocks are now scattered across 32 nodes so divided by 32 nodes so the size is going to be 2 power 35 that is by 32 gb it is 2 power 35 128 by that is 2 power 7 32 nodes that is 2 power 5 so 2 power 23 blocks are there per node so if you talk about a directory structure then each of the node have to maintain details about 2 power 10, 23 cache blocks or 2 power 23 blocks 
Now, how much is my directory storage per node? I have total 200 MB. So, 200 MB means 225 into 8. That is called 200. I am trying to represent uh, 200 as 25 into 8. Megabytes means 2 power 20 bytes. So, it is nothing but if I remove this 25 here, then total of 2 power 23 bytes would be there, this one. And then bytes to bits when I convert, this will be total of 2 power 26 bits. 25 into 2 power 26 bits is nothing but the storage in a directory. Now, directory storage requirement per block. So, this is the total. So, how many blocks that is been mapped? 2 power 23 blocks. So, 25 into 2 power 26 bits will keep information about how many blocks? 2 power 26 blocks are there. That is essentially what I am going to talk here. So, this will give you 200 bits per block. So, how this is 2 power 23. So, 25 into 2 power 26 bits is my total directory storage. How many blocks I have? 2 power 23 blocks. There is a small mistake here. So, 2 power 23 blocks are there. This shows that I am having 200 bits of information in my directory structure per block. Now, how much is there per block? I have p processors plus 1 that is going to be 200. So, each directory entry has p plus 1 bits where p plus 1 is equal to 200 that you get. So, I am going to talk about 199 processors in this design. So, what is the summary in this case? We are talking about a directory structure, total physical address capacity is given. I am telling that by cache block size is 128 bytes. So, from the total physical capacity, I know how much is going to be my one block. And now, when I divide that, we will get total number of blocks in the system. These total number of blocks, I am using a directory structure where it is distributed to 32 nodes. That means, physically this total 32 GB is scattered across 32 nodes and each node will keep some information about those cache blocks. So, how do you divide that? So, that division is done with the total 32 GB is being divided by 128 by 32. Then you will get total number of blocks that are stored per block. Now, the directory storage is 200 MB with the bit and byte translation I will get 25 into 2 power 26 bits is my 200 MB. This is the information of how much blocks? This is the information of 2 power 23 blocks. So, when I divide, I get that for each block, I am reserving 200 bits. And what is the structure of each block? There are p processors and plus 1 exclusive bit in this particular protocol. So, my p plus 1 is equal to 200 and p equal to 199. That is the way how we solved. Let us now move into one more question. Consider four processors for memory locations in this case A, B, C, D. And I am going to talk about a 24 MB, 24 megabyte byte addressable physical address space. So, I am going to talk about 24 MB of my main memory and it is byte addressable. What are the addresses? A is equal to 125640, 125840, 125840, 125620. So, these are the hexadecimal addresses of this 24 MB. Now, there are three processes P1, P2 and P3 are operating the shared memory location in the following sequence. So, they are, they are using a 64 KB direct mapped cache with a block size of 20. 256 bytes. So, P1 performs a read on A, P2 performs a read on or some write on B, P3 reads A, P2 reads like that some read and write is given. I have no idea this A, B, C, D are they same block or different block. So, we have to figure it out. So, now the question is list out the bus transactions and corresponding actions taken by the cache controllers of P1, P2 and P3 on these operations. So, what is the question? Let me try to simplify it. We are given three processors P1, P2, P3, four memory locations, their address are given, the cache memory specifications are given. Now, some operations are being doing, are they on same memory, different memory, any transaction happen, we have to see. So, from the given data, let me try to find out the number of sets. I am going to talk about, what is a cache memory? 64 KB. So, it is 2 power 16. It is a direct mapped cache with a block size of 256 bytes. So, 2 power 16 by 2 power 8, it is 2 power 8. So, 2 power 8 sets are there. Since I am talking about 24 MB, 24 MB means 2 power 24 bytes are there. So, I have 24 bits in the physical address, 8 bits is for index. Since I am using 256 bytes as offset, 
again 8 bits for offset the remaining is for tag so 8 bit tag 8 bit index and 8 bit offset if that is the case the hexadecimal value of a b c and d are given the first 8 bits represent my tag represented in the red color in the address the green component represent the index and the black component represent the offset so if you look at this a is mapped to set 56 b to 58 c to 58 and d to 56 so their tag all are same so in this case we can know that a and c in this case like you have a is 56 and your d is 56 so a and d are mapped into the same cache block similarly c and b are mapped to the same cache block so this is what you will see here okay so in short from the address we can know a d they are mapped to set number 56 b and c are mapped to set number 58 tag is same so anything that you do on b somebody else is trying to perform something on c also it is going to have its own impact so with this details what we see is your a and your d set number 56 they are mapped to the same block b and c are also mapped into the same block so now for these kind of operations let us try to understand what are the things that is been done so let us take one by one so a and d are same b and c are same so p1 reads a so p1 reads a since everything is initially empty what is the set of operations that is been happening on p1 reads a p1 send a read request and accordingly p1 is moving into the shared state after that p2 is going to perform a write on b since p2 is going to perform a write on b it is basically a write miss that is happening and uh, then your b value would be kept in the modified state so this is going to be in the shared state and this is going to be in the modified state now the third request is p3 reads b so when p3 is going to read b then what happens is you have to understand b and c are same uh, p3 is going to perform a read on c so the address is now in invalid state a bus transaction is been put into so once a bus transaction is been put into p2 is going to see that it is already an m state so this will go to this and it is already a read state so it is going to perform a read miss so in this case c will become s and this will also become s so that is the shared state this also will become in the shared state because b and c are going to talk about the same one now p2 is going to read on b p2 is going to perform a read on b it's a local hit that you see there is no issue as far as that is concerned it's basically a read hit it's strictly local then p2 is going to write on d so d is first time that i am going to talk about a has kept so this a and d are the conflict a is kept under the shared state now d is going to perform a write so because of that write what happens is you are going to a modified state but someone else already keeping it so this will result in the shared state going to become an invalid so how that happens somebody is already in the modified state so when i move from i to m this read with an intention to modify is there accordingly somebody was there in the shared state and that will move to an invalid state so in short the moment my fifth operation is done it is going to have an impact on p1 reads a the next operation is p2 is going to perform a read on a already p2 has performed a write on b so the state is in the modified state so any read on a is considered as a local hit so there won't be any change at all so once you are familiar with the transition diagram from the processor side and the transition diagram from the bus side for each of these request we would be in a position to understand this so this is the way how it is going to be working and the last one is p3 is going to perform a write on c so p3 initially has read a, read a value c and then p2 is going to perform a local reading so now at this state what happened is p3 and p2 both are now accessing c and b so both are in s state now p3 wanted to perform a write so from this s state it will become modified so whatever was p2 keeping on b 
that will go to an invalid state. So, these are the basic state transition that is been happening. So, what we have done here? The concept is simple. We have given some addresses. From the address, we need to find it out. What are the set numbers and what are the tags? So, so we will find that certain addresses are of the same block. So, this is a case of some true sharing and false sharing cases and accordingly, we are able to figure out how the transition happens. So, looking at the state transition diagram, looking at the address, we will be in a position to extract out where what change happens. So, I hope with this uh, tutorial, with the coherence protocol that we already studied and working out with these problems, with real life examples of a sequence of instruction, there will be good clarity on how coherence protocol works. So, with this we are coming to the end of cache coherence and with the video lectures of the initial theoretical background together with today's tutorial video will give you a good grip on the subject. I hope you will enjoy the learning. Thank you.